December, a research station at the edge of Antarctica. The summer resupply window is closing. In a few weeks, the ocean will refreeze and the station will be cut off until next year. But right now, 50 scientists and support staff are waiting for something that hasn't arrived yet. Fuel, food, and equipment. Everything they need to survive the next 12 months. The only thing standing between them and evacuation is a ship fighting its way through hundreds of miles of frozen ocean, not sailing through it, fighting, breaking it. Mile by mile, at walking pace, sometimes slower, Antarctica's research stations can't survive on their own. They're entirely dependent on ships that must force open a path through ice thick enough to stop any normal vessel cold. This is how icebreakers keep the continent's scientific outposts alive, and how crews navigate one of the most violent maritime missions on Earth. McMurdo Station sits on the coast of Antarctica with a summer population of over a thousand. It has laboratories, dormitories, power plants, and vehicle maintenance facilities. It looks permanent, but it's not self-sufficient. The station requires roughly 7 million gallons of jet fuel every year, not for aircraft, for survival. That fuel generates every watt of electricity the station uses. It powers the heating systems that keep the buildings above freezing when outside temperatures drop to 60 below zero. Without it, the station's life support fails within days. Food is the other critical commodity. Over a thousand tons of it, frozen meat, vegetables, dry goods, fresh produce, must arrive in one delivery to feed the population for a full year. Scientific equipment follows. Telescopes, climate monitoring instruments, lab supplies, then construction materials, lumber, steel beams, plumbing parts, electrical wire, everything needed to maintain what amounts to a small, isolated town. Antarctica's research stations are marvels of engineering, but they're also entirely dependent on a supply line that stretches across the most violent ocean on Earth and must be forced through a frozen sea. The annual resupply isn't just logistics. It's the act that makes human presence on the continent possible for another year. The mission exists inside a narrow seasonal window, December through February, Antarctic summer. This is the only period when sea ice retreats enough to make a sea-based resupply even remotely feasible. Even then, the ice doesn't disappear. It thins. It breaks up into smaller pieces. It pulls back from the coast just enough to create a chance. A heavy icebreaker can exploit that chance. But the window is brief. The 24-hour daylight of polar summer becomes operationally critical. Once the ship reaches the station, unloading runs continuously. Day and night lose meaning under constant sun. Crews work in shifts around the clock because there's no time to waste. As February ends, temperatures plummet. The ocean begins refreezing, and it happens fast. New ice forms at the edges first, then spreads inward. What was navigable water one week becomes impassable the next. Any ship still in the ice when the freeze accelerates risks being trapped for the entire winter. Entrapment isn't just a delay. It's a survival scenario. The ship becomes a prison. Supplies meant for the station remain locked in the hold. Fuel meant to last the winter never makes it ashore. And the crew faces months in an environment they weren't equipped to endure long term. This deadline is non-negotiable. Nature doesn't care about mechanical failures, weather delays, or unexpected ice conditions. The mission either succeeds within the window or it fails. There's no extension, no second attempt until next year. The USCGC Polar Star displaces over 13,000 tons. Its diesel electric power plant generates 75,000 horsepower, comparable to an aircraft carrier. But the real design work isn't in the engines, it's in the hull. A normal ship has a sharp bow to cut through water efficiently. An icebreaker has the opposite. The Polar Star's bow is rounded, almost spoon-shaped. It doesn't cut, it climbs. When the ship approaches an ice sheet, the bow rides up onto the surface. The ship's enormous weight, 13,000 tons, concentrates on a relatively small section of ice. Ice is brittle. It can't flex much before it fails. The pressure builds until the ice cracks, then shatters. The ship smashes downward, breaking the ice and pushing the fragments aside with its flared hull. The ice belt, the section of hull around the waterline, takes the worst punishment. 
It's reinforced with steel plating several inches thick, made from low temperature steel that won't become brittle in extreme cold. Normal steel loses toughness below certain temperatures. In Antarctica, that's not acceptable. Power delivery matters as much as total power. Diesel electric systems give the ship precise control over thrust. Electric motors connected directly to the propellers can adjust torque instantly, crucial when maneuvering through tight ice channels or backing up for a ramming run. The ship also has self-rescue systems built in. Healing systems can rapidly pump tens of thousands of gallons of water between ballast tanks on opposite sides of the hull. This creates a rocking motion that breaks the ice's grip when the ship gets stuck. Bubbler systems force compressed air through small holes in the bow, creating a layer of bubbles between the steel and the ice. It's lubrication. It reduces friction and helps keep the ship moving forward instead of getting wedged in place. Before the ship even sees ice, there's the Southern Ocean. Loading takes weeks in ports like Hobart, Australia, or Littleton, New Zealand. Cranes work around the clock, stacking hundreds of shipping containers on deck and below. Placement is critical. Items needed first at the station must be accessible. Delicate scientific equipment goes deep in the hold where it's protected from the violence ahead. The deck becomes crowded with vehicles, construction modules, and containers, all lashed down with heavy chains. Then the ship leaves port and enters the latitudes known as the Roaring Forties, Furious Fifties, and Screaming Sixties. These are bands of ocean where wind circles the globe unimpeded by any major landmass. The result is some of the largest waves on Earth. For days, the icebreaker, designed for stability in ice, not comfort in open water, pitches and rolls continuously. Waves crash over the bow. Moving around inside the ship becomes difficult. Sleeping is difficult. Everything not secured slides or falls. This crossing can last a week or more, depending on weather and the ship's starting point. First contact with Antarctica isn't land, it's ice. Small pieces at first. Growlers the size of cars, burgy bits the size of small houses. Then fields of pancake ice, circular pieces of new ice that knock against each other and create raised edges. This is the ice edge, the boundary between open ocean and the consolidated pack. From this point forward, speed drops. Navigation transforms completely. An ice pilot takes over, standing on the bridge and reading the ice. They look for subtle visual cues, dark patches that indicate open water in leads, differences in color and texture that reveal whether ice is thin first-year ice or thick multi-year ice, and signs of pressure ridges where the ice has piled up into frozen mountain ranges. Satellite imagery helps plan the route at a large scale. Synthetic aperture radar can see through clouds and map ice conditions over hundreds of square miles. But satellites can't show everything. Ice conditions change rapidly, leads open and close. What looks navigable from space might be a dead end up close. Helicopters provide real-time reconnaissance. They fly 50 to 100 miles ahead of the ship, scouting the ice and radioing back the best path forward. This prevents the ship from spending hours traveling down a lead only to find it blocked. The goal isn't to demonstrate the ship's strength by plowing through the thickest ice in a straight line. It's to find weakness, to exploit cracks, leads, and thinner sections to choose the path of least resistance. In first year ice that formed over the previous winter, typically up to two meters thick, the ship can move in continuous mode. The spoon bow rides up, the weight cracks the ice and broken pieces are pushed aside. Progress is steady at a few knots. Walking pace, but not all ice is first year ice. Multi-year ice has survived multiple melt seasons. It's denser, harder, and more like concrete than a brittle plate. Pressure ridges form when two ice flows collide, piling ice into massive formations. Walls above the surface, deep keels below. These can be tens of meters thick. Continuous braking doesn't work. The ship stops making forward progress. At this point, the operation changes. The ship must ram. The ship reverses, backing up perhaps half a mile down the channel it just created. Then the engines throttle to full power. The 13,000-ton vessel accelerates to 10 or 15 knots. The impact is monumental, reverberating through every deck. The bow rides up onto the ice, groaning and screeching. The ship might gain a few dozen feet, sometimes less. Then it backs up and does it again, for hours, sometimes for days. Each cycle subjects the hull to enormous stress. Each impact tests the reinforced ice belt and each repetition exhausts the crew, who endure the violent motion with no relief. 
The greatest fear is becoming beset, stuck fast when wind and currents compress the ice field around the ship with pressure that can trap a vessel for weeks or crush the hull. Ice under pressure can squeeze the channel behind the ship shut almost immediately, eliminating any escape route. The noise never stops. During continuous braking, it's a grinding roar punctuated by sharp cracks as ice shatters. During ramming, it's the buildup of engine noise followed by the explosive crash of impact. The ship is never quiet. Crew members wear hearing protection on deck. Below deck, the noise is muted but still constant, a background vibration that becomes part of the environment. The vibration is physical, high frequency during steady braking, violent lurching during ramming, objects that aren't secured shift or fall. Walking requires balance adjustments. Sleeping requires getting used to a bed that never stops moving. Crew work in watches, typically four or eight hours on duty, followed by rest. For the bridge crew, a watch means standing and staring out at a white landscape, reading the ice, making navigation decisions, and coordinating with the ice pilot. It requires sustained concentration in an environment that assaults the senses. For the engineers, a watch means monitoring and maintaining the ship's systems under extreme operational stress, engines running at maximum output for extended periods. Propellers are taking impacts from ice chunks. Electrical systems keep the entire ship powered in sub-zero temperatures. Fuel consumption is enormous. Breaking ice burns fuel at a rate far higher than open water transit. Any work on deck happens in brutal cold. Temperatures are consistently below freezing. Wind chill can drop the effective temperature to life-threatening levels. Exposed skin can get frostbite in minutes. Crew dress in multiple layers. Insulated coveralls, heavy gloves, and face protection. Even then, outdoor work is limited to short periods. For weeks or months, there's no internet beyond basic email, no cell service, no contact with the outside world except through the ship's communication systems. The ship is a self-contained universe. The crew becomes the only human contact anyone has. This deep isolation creates powerful bonds. Trust in your shipmate's competence isn't optional. It's absolute. A navigation error, a mechanical oversight, a cargo handling failure, any mistake can cascade into consequences for everyone. In an environment this hostile, survival is collective. Crew members rely on each other, not just professionally, but as the only social structure available. The ship becomes home. The crew becomes family, temporarily, but intensely. After weeks at sea and potentially weeks breaking ice, the ship arrives. The target for stations like McMurdo is the fast ice sea ice frozen to the land. The icebreaker's final task is to cut a channel through this ice to the station's ice pier. This channel can be 30 miles long or more, carved through ice thick enough to support heavy equipment. The ice pier itself is a platform of stable, thick ice where the ship can moor. Heavy lines secure the vessel. Anchors are drilled directly into the ice. Once moored, the operation shifts from navigation to logistics. Unloading begins immediately and doesn't stop. Under the 24-hour sun, cranes on the ship and on the ice pier work in tandem. They lift containers, vehicles, and pallets from the hold and deck, placing them onto sleds or specialized ice trucks. A continuous convoy moves supplies from the pier to the station's storage areas. The operation runs for one to two weeks, pausing only for severe weather. In Antarctic terms, severe means condition one, high winds and zero visibility that make outdoor work impossible. Short of that, the work continues. Ship crew, station personnel, and often military logistics teams coordinate the effort. Everyone has a role. Scientists who came to Antarctica to study ice cores or atmospheric chemistry find themselves unloading cargo. Support staff who maintain the station's infrastructure work alongside Navy cargo handlers. The scale of the operation requires every available person. The most critical and hazardous part is the fuel transfer. A massive, flexible hose, hundreds of meters long, is floated across the ice from the tanker vessel to the station's fuel storage tanks. For several days, millions of gallons of jet fuel pump through this line. This is a period of high alert. Spill response teams stand by continuously. The hose's pressure and integrity are monitored constantly. The ice underneath is shifting subtly with tides and currents. The temperature is far below the fuel's flash point, but a rupture would still be catastrophic, not as a fire risk, but as an environmental disaster. Fuel spilled on Antarctic ice is nearly impossible to fully remediate. When the fuel transfer completes without incident, it's a milestone. 
The station now has the energy it needs to survive the next year. The rest of the cargo, food, equipment, materials is essential, but fuel is the absolute lifeline. As the ship empties, it begins to fill again. The Antarctic Treaty's protocol on environmental protection is unambiguous. Virtually everything brought to the continent must eventually be removed. This isn't a recommendation. It's a mandate enforced by international agreement. Retrograde cargo has been accumulating at the station all year. Waste is sorted and compacted. Human waste, chemical waste, solid waste. Broken machinery is disassembled and packed. Old building materials are bundled. Obsolete scientific equipment is crated. Even used vehicles that have reached the end of their Antarctic service life are loaded onto the ship. Containers that arrive full of supplies are now filled with refuse. The ice pier, which was crowded with incoming cargo at the start of the operation, becomes crowded with outgoing cargo. The ship's hold, which was emptied over days of continuous unloading, refills at nearly the same rate. By the time the ship is ready to depart, it's almost as full as when it arrived. The mission is a closed loop. Human presence on Antarctica is temporary and reversible by design. The continent remains pristine not because humans don't leave waste, but because humans are required to remove it. Departure is carefully timed. The seasonal window is closing. The ship must transit back through the ice channel it carved, which may have partially refrozen or been compressed by shifting ice. Then comes the return crossing of the Southern Ocean, this time with the ship loaded with waste instead of supplies. For the crew, departure signals mission success. They've delivered what was needed. They've removed what had to go. They've kept the stations alive for another year, and they've done it within the narrow window that nature allowed. The winter over crew left behind, the small group that will remain at the station through the dark months, watches the ship depart. For them, the arrival of the icebreaker was a brief connection to the outside world. Now they begin months of isolation, sustained by the fuel and food that just arrived. Antarctic resupply missions reveal something about how humans maintain presence in environments that fundamentally reject them. The engineering is necessary. The reinforced hulls, the massive engines, the self-rescue systems. But engineering alone doesn't explain why the missions succeed. What makes the difference is precision in timing, judgment in navigation, and endurance under conditions that assault every sense. The crews who operate these ships don't fight the ice by overpowering it. They fight it by reading it, finding its weaknesses, and exploiting the narrow windows when progress is possible. The stakes are absolute. A failed mission doesn't just mean inconvenience. It means evacuation, abandoned research, and wasted years of preparation. The stations depend entirely on ships that can force their way through hundreds of miles of frozen ocean, deliver millions of gallons of fuel and thousands of tons of cargo, and escape before the trap closes. It's a mission that happens every year in near total obscurity at the bottom of the world. And every year, it's the only thing standing between human presence on Antarctica and the continents return to complete isolation.